Hi, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the panel on the social shaping of privacy enhancing technology. My name is uh, Sonja van der Graaf. I'm working at IMINES and I will be chairing this uh, session. I'm going to introduce uh, the, our panel, our uh, presenters for this afternoon. Um, we have Ari Lampinen. She's a researcher at the Helsinki Institute for Information Technology, HIIT, and she's a PhD candidate in social psychology in the Department of Social Research at the University of Helsinki. In her dissertation, um, she examines the practices um, of users of social media and what they have for the boundary regulations in terms of identity work and self-presentation. Previously, she has spent a year as a Fulbright visiting student researcher at the School of Information at the University of California at Berkeley. And outside of academia, she has worked for Microsoft Research in New England and United States, as well as United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and Statistics Finland. Then we have um, Kate Raines Goldie. She's a researcher and teacher at the Department of Internet Studies at Curtin University in Australia. She recently completed a PhD also at Curtin University. Her thesis uh, is a layered ethnographic study of a community of 20-something Facebook users, as well as the company behind Facebook. She draws on science studies and STS. Her thesis also connects historically rooted philosophies and ideologies of the Bay Area and California with the architecture of privacy and social media. Her thesis really provides a critical background for the philosophy behind and implications of Facebook privacy architecture. Before that, she was a faculty at the uh, CFC Media Labs Interactive um, Art and Entertainment Program, where she ran the Social and Network Media Unit. She was also a research associate at Ryerson University Experiential Design and Gaming Environment uh, Lab in Canada. Then Ralph DeWolf, he's a colleague of mine. He holds a master's degree in sociology from the University of Ghent where he also completed a degree in teaching political and social sciences. He's now working um, as a PhD researcher within the user research unit of iMinds at the Free University of Brussels. And his PhD focuses on the social aspects of security and privacy for online social network sites. And key issues that he looks include the relationship between identity and privacy and contextual privacy problems. Then we have Rula Sayav. She holds a master's degree in artificial intelligence from the University of KU in Leuven. She's currently doing her PhD at Distrinet, also at the KUL, under the supervision of Professor Dave Clark. Her research focuses on the access control models in online social networks. She's also part of the interdisciplinary project Security and Privacy in Social Networks, or SPION. Then we have Bettina Berendt on uh, the, the, the end of the table. She's an assistant professor in the De Declarative Languages and Artificial Intelligence Group, DTIA, at the Department of Computer Sciences at the KU Leuven. She studied business administration, economics, and artificial intelligence and computer science in Berlin, Cambridge, and Edinburgh. Um, in 1998, she obtained her PhD in computer science from the doctoral program in Cogn cognitive science at the Hamburg University. Um, from two, 1996 to 2001, she was a researcher for the German Science Foundation in the spatial structures and aspect maps at Hamburg University. Um, the interdisciplinary research group of Otto von Gürkeke University in Magdeburg and at the Department of Pedagogy and Informatics at Humboldt. Then, last but not least, is our discussant, uh, Lawrence Kleis, and she's currently a lecturer at the Free University of Brussels, and she obtained uh, a degree in sociology and gender studies and a PhD in communication sciences from the University of Ghent. She was a researcher for the Policy Research uh, Center on Equal Opportunities at the University of Antwerp, where she studied the meaning of equal opportunities in a network society. Um, last few years, she has also been involved uh, at the ambient media applications research team of the Alcatel, uh, Lucent Bell Labs in Antwerp, um, where she investigated the role and implementation of end-user development tools for program and contextual aware systems and application creation platforms. So this is a really good group of people and um, we're looking forward to the presentations and your questions later on. Thank you.
And so Ari Lampinen from Helsinki, I'm talking about practices in personal boundary regulation in the context of social network services. So bringing us now back again to the more social privacy issues, though I would like to stress that they're not separate from the more institutional side, as we'll surely see also in the other talks in this panel. And I'll be talking on based on some qualitative studies, mostly interviews in Finland and in the US with young adults, and looking into a bundle of examples from different services, so not just Facebook, trying to push us to different sites. Are you guys hearing me okay? Because the mic is doing some incredibly interesting stuff over here. Cool. But so that's the baseline. I've been looking at the practices today. I won't be going into them in as in much depth, but going forward to give you a little bit of a frame of how I think about privacy and what the corner is, that I'm approaching it from, you, some of you are most certainly familiar with Erwin Altman's notion of privacy as boundary regulation. So this notion of looking at privacy as a process and negotiation among people, and also highlighting that it's not just about withdrawing information and shutting things down, but also purposely opening things up and achieving connections where also too little interaction can come off as a privacy violation, which is something that we easily forget when we think about information structures. And so really focusing on what people actually do, how they negotiate with one another, and once we take it, take this old theory in the context of network, the network world, thinking about what do we do with the tools we have, with the privacy settings we have, but then also despite of them, so the ways people manage their privacy are not limited to what they can do in terms of adjusting their privacy settings. They're not even limited to choosing between the options that different services are providing them, but they actually go quite, quite far beyond, beyond that. So those are the starting points I would like to launch into three questions that might help us get forward. I won't be offering any solutions, unfortunately, but hopefully the questions will help us dig deeper into what they really difficult issues are. So first, what if we looked beyond online? We easily think of privacy in the network world as something that is restricted to what do people do online. But once we start looking at how people actually think about their social lives, online and offline, interactions of course aren't separate. They're quite tightly interwoven. And as a couple of examples of that, first, if we think of couchsurfing, a site where people can connect with strangers and invite or offer to accommodate them at their homes. Their neg the negotiations start online, but then quite crucially and integral to the process is that people actually meet face to face, typically in domestic spaces. And there, the negotiations really range far beyond what's happening on the services. And as another example, thinking of something that is now discussed more and more under the rubric of collaborative consumption, thinking into how people connect online and then go and do different kinds of exchanges in their local communities. So there as well, you might start an interaction online, you might be sharing information online, but then the interaction is not limited to what's happening in the system. And also when people try to regulate interactions in these kinds of settings, what they do online affects how they can behave offline, but also the other way around. If we think back to the couch surfing example, experiences of what happened when someone stayed with you might prompt you to update your profile, which again helps you regulate what happens when the next one comes by. And then going beyond from that, what if we look beyond the individual? So that's another thing that comes up a lot and is something that I admit is really hard for law and technology to transcend, to focus on the individual agent that is in charge of their own lives. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> sorry for the mic. So looking beyond the individual, how do people work together with their privacy and also to what degree is this even an individual problem? So if we now think back to Facebook and the same goes to a lot of other services. So as we've heard over yesterday and today, people can be sharing things on behalf of others. So you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily the one who's sharing things yourself. And how do you regulate your privacy in that set setup? And then again, also, you yourself are sharing things that affect others. 
and you view their content and you make interpretation out of it. And there too, it's quite tightly interlinked. So cooperation is something that is quite integral to how people are actually going about regulating their boundaries. And I think of that in two, on, on two levels. First, in terms of the kind of obvious, obvious corporations that we do, where people actually negotiate what type of content is okay to be shared, which photos do we publish, or they ask someone to take something down if they feel that that violates their privacy somehow. But then, even more important than something that you don't necessarily recognize as cooperation as much, is everything that's happening in terms of contesting or supporting what others are putting forth. If you think of it, think of these domains in terms of people building some kind of a self-presentation and trying to put forth their understanding of what's happening in the world and how they think about it. Others can always challenge those claims or they can support them either actively or more silently. And those types of co collaborations are important to, to think about as well. And here is where it gets really tricky because when, even when people are trying to collaborate and they are trying to take others into account, which is of course not something that is always happening even among peers and a lot of the problems we see are, are cases where people are doing consciously stuff that they would know that others won't be too happy about. But even when we try to take others into account, it's difficult because the norms of these sites or the norms that people work with around interaction, what's appropriate, what's not, they're very local to different communities. But then services typically are global. So even if I try to think what my friend would assume of something, whether something would be okay with them, it might seem that it's completely fine in our group of friends and with, with that, those parts of his network that I know, but I don't necessarily know all of their networks. And things that have been coming up in our interviews, a good example are international students where once they're, say, in Helsinki, their peer group might be sharing photos that are completely fine in the context of Finnish students or Finnish student life. But then their relatives back in Asia or, or India might be thinking about things very differently and they might think of some of those contents very disconcerting. So taking others into account isn't as straightforward as we would think and just relying purely on some shared understanding that is often not even discussed as much, but more assumed, is not really a strong protection in terms of how, how to go about regulating boundaries. And of course, it's not even evident how it should be, because this is quite inherent to social life, that we're not in full control of what's, what's happening. I can be giving my talk up here, but one of you, there's not really anything but social norms stopping any one of you of standing up and shouting something that puts my talk in a very different light and frames the whole situation differently. So full control of how, how we come off was never really part of the deal. But the network context makes these, these, these situations much more complicated as information persists. It will spread further and wider than it used to in face-to-face -face situations and so on. So then even if some of the were not really fully in control, things are as they were before the context has changed in many ways. But then to get to a slightly more positive note, what about if we think of people having better access to their own data? Because what I keep hearing in the privacy discussion is this notion that we should make sure that people are in control of their own data, which makes a lot of sense, but then at the same time, it's not always really clear whether they have any control or even knowledge of that data to begin with. And especially once we start thinking about behavioral data, even in the context of social network services and automated sharing, it might often be that other users have in some ways a better view to what's happening with your data and especially the service providers. But to give you some examples of what I mean by getting to better access Last.fm. It's a music-focused social network service where people can stream their music listening information in real time. And what we saw in, in interviewing people who use, use and willingly use this service is that many actually found a lot of value, not just in sharing the information about what they're listening to with others, but getting those records for themselves where they could then reflect on them 
seen aggregate what they're actually listening to, and some then ended up changing what they're listening because they realized, like, well, I don't want to be the kind of person who's just constantly doing this when I actually think of myself more as a person who's listening to this other genre of music. Where, where then our data could actually lead us to think about things differently. And as another example, a startup from Finland, Scoopinion, last week came out with a media fingerprint. So what the service does is to track what you're reading online on whitelisted news services, blogs, different kinds of online content, and give you a recommendation based on that. And for, to begin with, they had this radical transparent model akin to frictionless sharing as, and as envisioned by Facebook. But then they ended up shutting that down because users weren't too keen on it. And for a long time, then it was just a black box. You couldn't really see what was happening. You were just getting recommendations. But now what they're doing currently is to actually show you your own reading data. So here's now an example from my, my readings where you can see which other platforms you use the most, how, how long have you spent reading news online. And this kind of information could be quite interesting for users to think about not only in terms of what they're doing themselves and getting these self-reflective -ref moments, but also in terms of making it concrete that service providers out there have all this information on us, but seeing it in an aggregate form like this might make it more concrete and then also help maybe users think about whether they want to opt in or opt out and what's happening around them. So I'll conclude here. Three points, thinking beyond online, thinking beyond the individual, and then also thinking whether we can empower people with their own data better than we do currently. Thanks. My name is Kate Rainscoldy, um, and I just completed a PhD uh, at the Internet Studies Department at Curtin University, and I looked at privacy in Facebook, so my talk is largely based on that research. So as we've uh, talked on a lot in the past two days, um, our focus really in discussing privacy and privacy issues is really user-focused, and this is especially true in the kind of mainstream discourse around um, online privacy, and we tend to, in mainstream discourse, really blame the user for privacy issues. And this is especially true of youth, as Alice Marwick talked about yesterday. Um, and at the same time, we tend to be very forgiving of Facebook in terms of what they're doing in terms of their questionable privacy practices. So again, in the mainstream media, there tends to be kind of a lot of um, the use of the word privacy blunder or misstep, as if Facebook just kind of, if they could just try harder or kind of were more aware of privacy, then maybe they would do a better job of protecting it. But there's nothing malicious going on. They're just kind of blundering along and hopefully something better will happen. So the problem with these kind of two perspectives is that Mark Zuckerberg, who is the CEO of Facebook, as I'm sure we all know, has basically said that he doesn't care about privacy. And what this really means is it's not so much that he doesn't just care about privacy, but he actually believes in this thing called radical transparency. And what radical transparency is, is it's belief that if we all live in this way where we're opening, we're opening ourselves up and sharing and being radically honest with each other, then our lives will be better, the world will be improved, we'll have more empathy, and all of these kind of good social things will happen. But what this really means is he wants to get rid of privacy. And so this is an insignia um, that the employees of Facebook had in their, their hoodies um, in two years ago. So it's kind of secret cultish insignia. Um, and as you can see, the kind of um, secret or semi-secret um, mission of Facebook is to make the world more open and connected. And so what this is code for is less privacy or no privacy. And so um, in a statement to his investors earlier this year, he said, Facebook was not originally created to be a company. It was built to accomplish a social mission to make the world more open and connected, which again sounds great, but if you substitute make the world less private or have no privacy, then Facebook is on a social mission to make the world less private, which is a little bit scary. And so the point of all this is that we really need to think about the ideologies and discourses embedded in technology um, 
when we're talking about privacy issues. We can't just be looking at users. Um, and so, so Mark Zuckerberg really, really believes that this is the way to go. This is really, really important. And it really shows how um, it's really important to be thinking beyond just users. So how does this manifest in Facebook? The radically transparent architecture of Facebook um, is, is, you can see it in terms of friendship. So basically all friends are, are by default treated equally. So your, um, your boss, your ex-lover, your um, best friend all get by default access to the same information. We have one profile and one context on Facebook. So this kind of goes against the way that we would normally interact in the physical world where we would have our home context, our work context, um, our perhaps religious context. These are all different things. And the other thing that Facebook does to really kind of push this radically transparent architecture is that the uh, default sharing settings have gone since 2004 from being open, sorry, from being closed to being open. So we can see that these kind of this architectural, um, th this belief about the world and radical transparency is really built into the system of Facebook and is really pushing users, um, even if they are concerned about privacy, which they are, it's really, really difficult because the choices are limited by this. So if we think back to 2004, um, the way that we used the internet was a little bit different from today. And um, this is an interesting quote from Mark Zuckerberg again. Four years ago, when Facebook was just getting started, most people didn't want to put personal information about themselves on the internet. So we got people through this really big hurdle of getting people to want to put up their full name, a real picture, a mobile phone number, and connections to real people. So we can see that this is, you know, this is a conscious thing that they were trying to actually get us to be more radically transparent. And it wasn't just kind of a privacy blunder or mistake. And so if we compare the original Facebook, which I'm calling the Facebook, as that was its original name, to the Facebook of today, we can see on a number of different fronts, things have really changed. So as mentioned, the default settings have gone from mostly closed to mostly open. The users originally were students. Now it's everybody. The context was that of a dorm room or a college. Now it's all context. And the access control that prevented, um, that kind of made the, the, the original Facebook more of a walled garden than it is today, um, was that you had to have a university email from an approved university to get access. Now it's just anybody with an email address can get access. So what's happened is that Facebook has taken this, originally Facebook was this walled garden where you could go, and it was very clear what the context was. So as a student, you would go and post things that would be interesting to other students. So putting drinking photos, um, pictures of partying was completely acceptable and you felt that that would be okay because no other people who were not students could not get in. So when in 2006, the, uh, when Facebook opened to everybody, what happened was is this culture of kind of sharing and being really open um, that wasn't, people weren't really exactly used to at the internet, the t on the internet at the time, became this, the new users came and said, oh, okay, this is how you behave on Facebook and so we're going to do this too. So it was a bait and switch. So even though um, the, the Facebook was no longer a walled garden, it still had that kind of open and transparent culture. And so the reason that this worked, the reason that Facebook's strategy of um, pushing towards this um, open and transparent culture worked is that, and um, Aria uh, touched on this, is that uh, privacy is part of a social practice. And so it's this thing we do together, we collaborate on, we, it's not just kind of this thing that happens um, on our own. Um, and this, another piece of my uh, really important part of my thesis was this distinction between social privacy and, and institutional privacy. And so social privacy is very much about that kind of management of sociality. And so, um, and forgive me for this, this is, I wanted, the struggle with my PhD was that I really never knew what to say to people and they said, well, now that you've told me all these horrible things, what should I do? And so I've been really struggling to think, okay, what, what can we do? What is the solution here? Um, and so this came to me on the plane. So this is a really new idea that I want to throw out to you guys. Um, and it's kind of coming from left field, so I'll just share it with you. But just uh, my apologies, it's not very polished. Um, so I've been taking this uh, facilitator course for, for basically helping people to become sustainable, to live sustainably. Um, and it's a very effective course. And what they do is they actually teach people the, the kind of skills and the tools that they need to make change in their lives. And it's very much about changing norms and changing habits. You can kind of maybe see where I'm going here. Um, but the two people who taught the course, they, taught, they originally had taken it as students a few years ago. And they 
uh, were so inspired, they, they decided to completely overhaul their house and turn it into this sustainable house. Then their neighbors decided that this was a really good idea, so they did it as well. And then their whole street did it. So this really shows the kind of power of other people in community in making change. So now they have um, a community garden on the street, they have uh, car sharing, they have um, a festival that happens every year where they shut down the whole street and the whole kind of town comes and participates in the sustainability fiesta, as they call it. So it really shows that this kind of strategy for getting people to make change really works. And so the way they do it is it's based very much on rewards. So it's a seven week course and every week you have a celebration of the changes that people have made in their lives. Um, and it's very much about community support and peer pressure. So kind of using your peers to encourage you to keep making changes in your lives and celebrating it when you do. And so I realized as I took this, that this is really kind of how Facebook got people to behave differently um, on, on Facebook through rewards. You get um, rewarded for sharing information on Facebook. Your friends kind of comment on your photos and it makes you feel good. Um, there's that community support or community peer, peer kind of pressure that this is how you behave on Facebook and the norms are creative, created collaboratively. So I'm not really sure where this is going, but we've talked a lot about network effects. And network effects are really about community and social, sociality. And so this kind of connection between privacy and social interaction I think is really important. And you know, why did Diaspora fail? Probably because of network effects. And so, I'm not, again, I'm not really sure where this is going, but I feel that this might be something that is really important to consider in maybe if Facebook used this tactic to get people to behave differently on Facebook, maybe we can do something, or maybe this isn't really important to think about these kind of dynamics when creating our own alternatives to Facebook and helping them to be successful. So I'm curious to get your feedback and think about this, um, but that's... I'm going to leave it there, so thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ralph De Wolf. I work at iMinds, and I'm also involved in the Spying Project. So basically, within the Spying Project, my goal is to understand the user's practices, privacy practices, and identity practices, and try to translate that into requirements. We call it social requirements, and, and, and in the end, the new technologies, and uh, also evaluate those technologies as well. So basically what I want to do today is I want to talk about researching social privacy and developing alternative privacy technologies but really focusing on the user. So basically social network sites uh, are used for social in interaction, they are used for impression management like um, Ayri told and like uh, Rins Goldie told as well. They are also used for self-validation, for building up bonding and bridging social capital, um, building communities. So on the one hand, we could really say that social network sites create a lot of opportunities. And then again, through domesticating these new technologies into our everyday practices, the online media environment becomes a given. And including the assumptions that social network sites providers have on privacy and on sociality. Uh, on sociality. So basically, this creates problems. This is a very unbalanced approach. So. Um, I'm going to keep using the differentiation between uh, informational privacy and social privacy. It's also been used in previous panels as well. We also use other concepts like privacy as object and privacy as subject. But basically, the literature has exposed a lot of privacy problems that the user has to deal with. Um, social privacy is defined as a control of information flow about how and when personal information is shared with other people. And information, um, informational privacy or institutional privacy or whatever you want to call it, it's more focusing on how information is being used by private entities for commercial reasons or other reasons as surveillance or direct marketing. So I think that there's a really unbalanced approach and I think that within the Spine project we also recognize this. So basically we need to equip the, the user with alternative solutions. And in developing those solutions, it's really important that we involve the users as well. So basically what I want to do is I want to show the different steps on how you can 
make sure that a user's stake is incorporated in uh, the technology building process. So basically, you've seen this uh, tomorrow as well. Uh, Claudia Diaz made a separation between, um, it's a paper of uh, Seda from Claudia. They make a separation between um, experts uh, defining problems and users defining problems. So basically, um, I want to build further upon this and state what the problem with this is as well. So when you look at experts um, um, defining the problem, it's more of, most of the time uh, focused on informational privacy. Users do not really know what's happening with their data or really do not know about behavioral tracking and such. So basically, they cannot really um, expose their privacy concerns if they're not conscious about it. So basically, then it's the experts that define this, um, this problem. On the other hand, social privacy problems, it's been mentioned quite a lot today, like context collision, um, invisible audiences, uh, uh, emerging between public and private sphere. Most of the time, such problems are being mentioned by users as, as well. Um, so basically, what's positive with the expert definition is that it's really critical towards uh, privacy policy of online social network sites. It's really questioning their policy. A negative point is that users are not at all familiar with those problems. A positive thing about a uh, user definition of the privacy problem is that it's something that a user is affiliated with because it's, yeah, it's really within his everyday practices. But then again, the problem with that is that they often will not question the privacy policy of online social network sites. They're really embedded into that technology. So my advice for experts is really pre-test and test the definitions, uh, the definition of the problem with potential users as well. Because otherwise, we're really normative. We're really saying from this is the problem, and here's the, here's the technology, deal with it. So basically, also, although it's not very easy to do, I recognize that, we should try to focus and incorporate the user even with the expert definition. The other, uh, the other definition is um, it's user-driven. And basically, when you look at social privacy research, a lot of attention goes to um, evaluating existing so uh, solutions, like how are they currently using their privacy settings? Are they setting it on public or private to their friends only? Are they using aspects on Diaspora? Are they using the circles on Google Plus? And what manner are they using it? But basically, I, as a social privacy researcher, want to really want to emphasize that do not only focus on this as well, because this gives us a really strict view on social privacy. It's always embedded within that technology. So focus on offline, are you, as also mentioned, focus on offline privacy as well. Focus on other social network sites and focus on alternative solutions. Um, then the second thing is identifi identifying the solution. So. After we have the problem, we should find a solution. Um, so basically, through developing privacy technologies, we might as well affect the reasons why, our social why users are on those networks in the first place. So basically, we want to avoid such a problem. So what my uh, advice is, is really to make explicit the opportunities that online social network sites have right now, we really have a lot of information, as well as the characteristics of online social network sites that those opportunities are based upon. Then, on the other side, you really should look at a, an, an assumption to solve your previously defined privacy problem and then develop your solution. But you all you, you have to make this process really explicit. So this may sound a bit abstract, so I have a clear example for this. So basically, the definition of the privacy problem I think we all recognize that invisible audiences or context collision is a social privacy problem. For example, a parent seeing a drunken photograph of his or her teenage son or, or daughter on Facebook, it's probably an audience that the teenager did not have in mind when posting such things or when other people posted such, such things. So basically, what, what's the problem then is that the, actual, that the imagined audience and the actual audience are not overlapping. So we could, my, uh, we could assume that making the users aware of their audience may make them more conscious and, make them, and give them the opportunity to align their uh, imagined audience with the actual audience. So making the invisible audience more visible. So basically a concrete solution that's also been worked upon in the Spine project is Freeview. It's a semi-automatic and inter interactive grouping tool. It's shown by Bo Gao in, uh, in the square. Uh, <laughs> And it really gives you uh, feedback of who your audience is. 
So then again, we have the solution, but like I mentioned, we also should look at the, at the opportunities of online social network sites right now. I've done a lot of research on context collision on invisible audiences. I've done more than 42 interviews right now. And basically what I've noticed and, is that an ambiguous context environment, so basically where, where is this context collision, another really clear defined um, situation like this, can really be very lib uh, liberating. And it's really without the role limitations that you have or that, that are presented in the offline world that you can present yourself. So basically the opportunity then is the user is a, an actor on a stage and his friends are being turned into uh, his audience. So half a century ago, Irvin Goffman stated that everyday life looks like a performance on stage. I think with these new media that it's even more so the case. So th these things we must really, um, yeah, really recognize that these are opportunities. And then to make, it, uh, to make my example complete, when you look at Google Circles right now or aspects on Diaspora or slicing on Twitter, they're really focused on um, clearly uh, cutting up your different friends into different categories. So that's also a really conscious process that we do not have to do in an offline environment. So basically a solution could be to make them aware of their, their audience, but not really focusing on putting them into clear, uh, into clear categories. As we all knew, and the literature has also proven this, is that a lot of these technologies are not being used at all. So why, why focus further on that? Okay, um, this brings me to the technology itself. It's also mentioned this morning. It, to a certain extent, there has to be an awareness, but on the other extent, there has to be empowerment as well. So basically, I think that users are not always aware of their online privacy threats. And most of the time, I think that people just do and do not really question, question why they are engaged in certain activities. So basically, there has to be a certain amount of self-alienation. And I define this, define this concept as um, that when an individual looks at his own behavior from a third-person point of view. But then again, too much alienation might as well result in people not using the tool or, or yeah, social network sites at all. Um, so that's one thing that we have to do, and next to make the user reflect on his own behavior, we also need to empower them. So really enable people to control their own lives, to control their own technology. So I think these are the two most important characteristics that a solution must have. This brings me to the last thing, and uh, this is more of an approach that we have within Smith, the department that I'm working on, uh, the uh, department that I'm working in, and that's uh, user acceptance, community, and domestication. So basically, um, user acceptance, I guess that every user researcher would recognize this, is one of the pivotal factors in determining the success of a technology. So I'm going to quote um, uh, uh, the technology acceptance model, and that there are two important things, the perceived usefulness and the perceived ease of use. So basically, um, the perceived usefulness can be defined as the degree, degree to which an individual believes that using a particular system would enhance her or job performance. So basically the user has to believe that the privacy uh, technology is useful in enhancing his or her interpretation of privacy. And the other thing, and I think it's more of a usability thing, is a perceived ease of use. So basically the degree to which an individual believes that using a particular system would be free of physical and mental effort. So basically, the, not only does the user has to interpret it, the, the privacy technology as useful, it has to proceed very smoothly. This brings me to the other two concepts, is that um, we often tend to focus on an individual, but an individual is not floating around in thin air, he's always anchored in a certain community. So when we're born, we're, uh, we're growing up in a certain society that has goals, that has structures, that has norms and values, and not incorporating these things within a technology, I know it's difficult to do, is, yeah, it's really denying that a user is, not, is, is embedded in a certain society. So we really should take into account the community where the person is embedded in. And this brings me to the last concept of domestication. So domestication, it, it's taming a wild animal. Within technology studies, we also believe that uh, a technology can be tamed as well. And there's a quote from Deuze who states that Nowadays, we're more living in media than with media. And hereby, we have um, made online social network sites a part of our everyday environment. My suggestion is make those privacy technologies also part of th this environment. Do not only focus uh, li like social network sites right now. When we, when we uh, get up in the morning, we, get, we check Twitter 
probably a lot of people are now using Twitter as well. We check Facebook as well. So basically, we, we should nudge the people or we should, in one way or another, incorporate it in these practices that, so that's really domesticated. So my conclusion is that the user should, and I think also to a certain extent, can be incorporated in every step of the development process. So from defining the, the privacy problem to really embedding it in his everyday or her everyday life. And the last thing, and as a social privacy researcher, I really want to uh, put emphasis on this, is that we really need to question the social privacy uh, and social privacy policy and also on sociality of social network site providers. So really focus on alternative ways in studying social privacy. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, you can hear me, right? Um, uh, I'm Rula Seyaf, and I, uh, I'm a PhD student at Distronet, K. Leuven. I mainly work on access control and social software. But today I'm going to be work, uh, talking about the role of context in online social networks and uh, the, uh, the relationship with privacy, which we refer to as contextual privacy. But first, let's talk a bit about access control. So current available access control models are based on social aspects such as relationships between users, trust, attributes, roles, and reputation. Yet those, seems, those type of access controls are limited sometimes and they fail to protecting the privacy of users in certain cases. So while the concepts that I mentioned above are part of the social context, yet the, so, the context in general uh, have more context that if utilized in access control, then, and we argue that the, access, the control users would have uh, would be more fine-grained than, uh, what, uh, than the control that is offered currently in the, uh, in the current available access control model. In order to understand how you can utilize context, we need to first discuss a bit the characteristics of context in social software and in the online social networks that emerge from the interaction using this type of software. So when a user navigates the web and presses the like button, data is shipped into Facebook. Therefore, the context the user was in when he clicked the like button is blended into Facebook context. This makes data seems to, seems to be becoming part of the online social network context, where the web context cannot be separated anymore from the online social network context. In that case, context is said to be ambiguous. In, 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 such, in such ambiguous contexts, uh, the, re the cause of this ambiguity here is that Facebook's, Facebook is acting like a blender of context, where it forces the dissemination of data on the friends of the user himself. And one could argue, of course, that if the user does not click the like button, then there will be no blending of context. However, this feature might be actually useful for the user, but he might need to only share this data from the web with a certain uh, and specific set of users rather than everyone. In that sense, we here stress the importance of control over the context transformation as being the fundamental aspect that would give or that would offer balance between the functionality offered and the privacy preservation the users, uh, the users need. And this gets us closer, of course, to understanding the importance of context, of context uh, that we argued, or that we argue that is needed to be um, utilized in access control. In another scenario, a user posts, for example, a photo of his friend and shares, and shares it with friends. 
who are friends of the POSA, the drunken guy in the photo, and the drunken guy's boss who is not friends with the drunken guy in the online social network. For the photo poster, the audience are within his friend's context. But for the drunken guy, there are two main contexts. His friends, which is in that case um, not the boss, and the work context, which is the boss uh, part of. The poster does not see the photo as of a highly critical privacy state. It is a photo of, of a friend shared with friends who most probably know that the drunken guy is always sitting on his couch and getting drunk. If audience are invisible to each other, then even to the drunken guy, the photo does not, does not have a high and critical privacy state. But if the audience can know about the rest of the audience, then the drunken guy sees the photo of a highly critical privacy state given that, he's, that his boss is part of the audience. And in that case, it seems that as if that the work context is giving the photo a highly critical privacy state that indicates that the photo is inappropriate in such con context and should not be disclosed within this context. For the poster, of course, these contexts are not necessarily explicit. Thus, the, sp the specific context of the situation is ambiguous to him, but in that case, his reasoning is not being based on the actual context, which causes a, probably a privacy violation, not for the poster of the photo himself, but for another user, which is the drunken guy in that case. Another problem that might be caused by ambiguous context is inappropriate actions. In the same previous scenario, a comment embarrasses the drunken guy by mentioning an Im inappropriate or private information about his work without knowing that the boss, can, the boss of the drunken person can see the comment. The ambiguous context in that case affects the context-based reasoning of the commenter and results in, in an appropriate comment, which in, in turn affects the privacy states, the state of the drunken guy uh, photo, or in the drunken guy uh, personally, and in that case we see that invisible audience here affect the inference of other audience contexts and affects the ability uh, to judge the appropriateness of actions. Say a user posts a photo and he's happy with his new car and shares it with his friends. A friend can access the photo and even more can redisclose his photo on his profile with the possibility of adding more data to the post. When the car owner sees the photo shared by his friend, he feels angry and violated. But this is not because the photo was shared on his, on his friend's profile, but rather it's because of the change of the communicated message and the change of, therefore, of the context into a context of a sarcasm or making fun of the photo or the car. In the first context of the original owner and the data attribute, uh, sorry, uh, and the data attribute and the audience gives a certain meaning to the photo. And the second context, or the second context provides totally another, a different meaning of the photo. Thus, in this case, the change of context affects the meaning or, interpre or the interpretation of the photo, which uh, is perceived by the owner of the photo, at least, as a change of the privacy state leading to a privacy violation. Uh, in that example, I mean, I hope that the, the, the link between what, me what it means to put data in context and the meaning of the data within certain contexts and the change of privacy state within different contexts is more or less a bit clear. So based on uh, what we have seen, we can see that context usually provides data with meaning. So the same object might have different meanings in different data, and then the privacy state of the data object depends also on the context. And we define pri contextual privacy as the ability to define the privacy state of a data object in a context-based manner. And this way we see how context is important to facilitate contextual privacy. 
So how can we address context problems? Initially, as many uh, before has been, has talked that audience need to be visible. The actual audience and the potential audience who can see a post, this has to be also maintained over time. So if I add new friends to, uh, to my social uh, circle, then I need to be aware of, of, the new, of the access possible to the new friends. In, in case of ambiguous context, the context needs to become more explicit. And for that, we propose that the, uh, the user, in the case of the like, uh, the like button and blending of context, should have the control to, uh, to define his audience. In this, in this uh, scenario of multiple contexts, the three, the three friends uh, mutually share context with the person in the photo, uh, and one of them does not uh, belong to that context. In that case, we propose that we can probably have a mechanism that would elicit the most relevant context and only allow sharing of data within the, relevant, within the friends that belong to the relevant context only. In that case, the boss who belongs to a different context would be excluded from the list of audience. Also, if um, in case of the, uh, we can make the context more explicit by making also audience uh, aware of each other's, uh, each other's uh, context. Therefore, the visibility of audience would also help in that uh, case. And finally, in the change of context, we argue that the original, the original context in that case is defined by the title, the owner who posted it, and the audience who can see it. While in the second context, those parameters are changed. And in that case, in order to control the uh, context change, we propose a nexus control policies that are, based, based, that are defined based on these parameters that I've just mentioned. In that case, the policy would be uh, would define a certain access con constraints that would authorize the access to certain data, but it would also introduce obligations uh, that would tackle what would happen after the access. And in that case, we would cover the uh, what the context. This, the, the, we would constrain the context before the action and after the action happens. Uh, yeah, uh, in that case, we can pro we can define policies simply as like allow, allow my best friends to share uh, this uh, this photo, but then I could also uh, define obligations about how to preserve the state of the post in the new context it's shared within. And, but finally, one last word is that context, of course, has different type of different level of granularity, and uh, based on the parameters that are available in the uh, social software, at least we can define we can define certain levels of specificity. So, by what I have uh, presented before, the three parameters are not enough to define a fine gra granular context, but. Making use of these parameters into defining context would definitely offer more, more control to the audience. Of course, if we have mechanisms to define more parameters, then we could give or grant more control to users. Okay, thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, these very interesting presentations. I'm also very thankful to the organizers for inviting me to giving some reflections on the topic of social shaping of uh, privacy-enhancing technologies, because this was really the overall topic of this stream, the social shaping um, of the technologies. 
I think we tried the best to do really interdisciplinary thinking in this uh, panel, a little bit more than in the formal panel, although the panel was also very interesting, but here we also, we also try to uh, have uh, more social scientists and more technical scientists. And we see that people uh, cross the boundaries between disciplines. You see the vocabulary that Bettina uses has a lot of social science vocabulary. Um, Ralph is trying to translate his social science insights into um, what it could mean for services or applications. But we were also crossing boundaries between the online and the offline world, uh, between the individual and the collectivity, between the social and technical aspects, and between thinking globally and translating them to concrete examples. Um, but interdisciplinary Interdisciplinarity is great for thinking globally to making a bigger picture and having a lot of critical reflections, but it's much more difficult to define the next research steps. Like, what are we going to do now? We have been discussing for two days, we know a lot, but what are the next steps that we want to research? Where do we want to go to? It's a question also for the panel. Um, I'm also a bit when I hear social scientists giving their presentations, um, I'm also always a little bit afraid that they stay on the higher level of the technology, that they see like, okay, uh, the information that people share, but they don't look to the lower levels. What, is the, what are the lower technology implications and what does this mean? They are like not handling much of the invisible, the invisible of the technology, more the algorithms, the, the ways technologies work, it's something that's quite invisible for social scientists. So I think, how could we research these aspects of privacy tools also, is a question for social scientists. Um, and with such kind of presentations, I'm also always thinking like, what do uh, developers pick up? People who develop privacy-enhancing technologies or people uh, developing uh, social networking slides. If they hear such kind of presentations, what do they take home? And maybe we should think, what do we want them to take home? If someone working for Google or someone working for Facebook would sit here, what do we want him uh, to be sharing in the elevator when he goes back to his, to his company uh, with all these social research thoughts that we presented here? Um, Yes, uh, it's also common for social shaping of technology analysis that we look to the use and the domestication of these technologies into everyday life and the way people hack it or they reinvent it or uh, they change it to their wishes, um, what their practices of resistance are. And I think this is really much the, the research that Ralph and uh, Ari are doing. But what I really miss is um, uh, the producing uh, uh, side. How are these tools produced? What are the politics that are playing there? Uh, do we know a lot of research on the, on the production side of software? These invisible things that are, uh, this, they are, they are creating the tools that we use? Um, so also another question. And maybe we should research this side more. And I was wondering if uh, Kate, uh, who made a kind of historical reframing of, of what happens with Facebook and, and their policies of, on privacy, if she uh, could say, um, if she thinks that the user had an uh, impact on the final closure or the final uh, privacy way of, of handling of privacy by Facebook. Because this would be really a social shaping of technology research, uh, researching the user side, but also the, 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 the produ production side, and uh, trying to make this a circle. So I think this would be really be interesting if we also know more about this side of uh, uh, privacy-enhancing technology. Um, I also found the research of Rula very interesting, but I think very difficult to handle if we only think about uh, context and how different philosophers like Heidegger discuss about context and, and how it is situated and only constructed during the practices, and then we try to hand it over to the technology to define uh, 
the way context should structure if a message is sent or not. Um, so I'm wondering if handing over these very complex things, it's a te technical, uh, very interesting thing to research, but is it really something that we want to hand over to the machine? I must also think a bit about what Claudia said this morning, or, or Seda, like, what do we ha want to hand over to the machine, and what do we want to keep in our own hands? Um, so, it, it touches upon the notion of empowerment. Um, how do we fill in the concept of empowerment? Do we focus on transparency, on handing over the control to the user, or do we believe in un user-friendly but untransparent tools? Uh, should our final aim be to make software development manageable and adoptable for normal users, or should we use, or should we make it more a black box, close it more, and make it like very easy to use but not transparent? And then I'm also thinking if it's something that academics and uh, activists can do, create appealing privacy enhancement tools. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there will be, in a certain moment, like a business coming up, creating really sexy privacy enhancement tools, and that we will say, like, okay, we should have done this and everybody uses it, or if it's still a dream that this could happen. Creating something that people really want to use. Um, this handing over of the control uh, and making it user-friendly, it's for me also a really big discussion. What should we research? Maybe we should also research more on uh, development uh, tools. Uh, like, I don't know, Ralph said, like, the user should be in the thinking process, but also maybe thinking with, or social scientists should think with, uh, the engineers during the development process that we are not running behind effects, like we will evaluate what you created. Um, or maybe we should even try to change programming languages or creating some language above that end users could create their own privacy rules or other kind of rules that they can create the software that they want. But maybe these are really far away dreams. Um, I was also... Um, Oh, yeah. I also wanted to say that for me, during this conference, we focus very much on Facebook. Uh, this is because of the of the of the context of the of the uh, consortia, I think. But I think we sh should be very careful about this um, because of the growing importance of smartphones, smartphone applications. I'm also thinking about sensor networks. Uh, all this uh, geolocation, all this kind of data, what will happen if every object has an IP address and or we can um, put sensors everywhere or the government can put sensors everywhere, how can we make this kind of data more privacy uh, or take care that this is also uh, privacy uh, protected? Um, is there any research going on on this topic? And maybe we should uh, look forward that we're not running behind the facts, but that, really or, that we are there with certain tools or ideas before this is popping up everywhere and that the commercial world has uh, already decided how it will be used and what we can, uh, how can we, how, that we can control it or not control it. Um, so I think this is the... Uh, Something that I really would like to think about, what will the future be and where is our work for the future things so that we don't stick to social networks as they are right now. Because I remember uh, it was 10 years ago or something, or I was at the, one of the first conferences around uh, gender and IT it was, and uh, Sherry Turkle was, thinking, uh, was talking about the internet and how she imagined that it would be really feminist and freeing women from their roles of, 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 of being who they are and they could be whatever they wanted on the internet and it was very playful and all kind of great playful artistic ideas. So maybe in 10 years there will also be something totally different. So yes, this is also something to think about. What, what, what do we want to research for the future?
Thank you so much uh, for all the great presentations um, and for you to, uh, to summarize and come up with some really interesting thoughts uh, to, that we could discuss. Um, I was thinking, because you actually directed some question towards the panel, so maybe we should open up with, with one or two of these questions first, and then obviously uh, we take all kinds of questions and input from uh, you all in the audience. So which... Um, I, I, yeah, well. um, I understand more than eight, uh, nine or ten questions, so... <laughs> Uh, but basically, maybe it's interesting to um, show our next steps in our research. Um, like I said, one of the things that I find annoying within social privacy research is always the focus on um, studying existing social privacy tools and really also uh, focusing on commercial social network sites like Google Plus or like Facebook or like Twitter. So I think we should really focus on these alternative solutions. and. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that um, what I wanted, really wanted to know uh, as a social privacy researcher is how people were managing their audiences. But basically when you look at it on, on Facebook, people are not really using those groups or lists, so you really don't know by examining their online data. So what I've done is I used the card sorting met, uh, methods and I let them categorize more than 100 of their friends. And I really saw their process in managing their, 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 uh, their audiences. So basically my hope is to one way or another and um, uh, make that, convert that into a technology like a feedback and awareness tool so it's really based on the strategies that they're using. Or maybe also another type of access control model uh, like what Rula is doing, not really focusing on role-based or relationship-based access control but focusing on context as well. So these things, are, I, I, I think, that are the future steps that I'm going to do. Yes, Kate, perhaps you can... Yeah. To, uh, to, to kind of address the issue of um, does the user have impact, um, in my research, what I, I used a, a model by John Fisk, um, who is a cultural theorist who has a model of popular culture. And so basically his idea is that um, counter to kind of this media studies, television studies in the 70s where people are just kind of zombies who mindlessly consume television and are brainwashed by it. His idea was that um, the, the dominant creates this kind of materials for the, the, um, the citizens to uh, consume and then make their own. So an example would be going to the, mo the mall as a space of consumption, but um, there are people who go to the mall not to consume, but to, for example, do mall walking, which is just walking in a nice warm environment to get exercise. And so that's an example of kind of um, people making their own out of what they're, they're given. Uh, and that's how I approach Facebook, not to say that everybody's brainwashed by Facebook. And there were a lot of examples in my ethnography of users doing things to resist within kind of the constraints and the choices they were given. Um, so that's the perspective I came from, that there is, there is a give and take, but at the same time, the, there's an acknowledgement that the, the power dynamic is quite, there is quite a, a a difference, and um, I think that's important to acknowledge. And so, in thinking about does you know, do users have an impact in how Facebook designs things, I would say yes. But again, it's that um, unequal power dynamic where, um, in the way that Facebook has deployed changes, they'll kind of do things and really push privacy boundaries, and then people will complain, and then they'll kind of take one step back out of out of the two steps that they've pushed. So, I think maybe things are taking longer because of or things in terms of getting um, really that radical transparency thing happening. I think things are taking longer because users are resisting. Um, and I also think that users um, do things that, for example, there's the, if anybody remembers a long time ago on Facebook, it used to have a status update where it, it was imposed that, I think it was I am or third person, so Kate is. And so people would kind of hack that. And then Facebook went and changed that to make it more like a, a Twitter um, a Twitter update. So there are examples of things not related to privacy that I think users do have impact. Um, so yeah, that's that's my answer. Harry, you, you follow up on that a little bit. So in a similar way, in a lot of the things I've been seeing in my research are things where users are doing things that aren't really 
they're not predicated by the technology and they're not looking for the technology to solve the problems they're working with. And then, of course, as soon as we look more over to the social privacy realm, the question also becomes to what degree are we even talking about things that should be somehow solved by technology or law? And to what degree are we trying to understand how humans are actually interacting in our time? And what part of that is really even something that should be translated? So thinking back to Larry Lessig's for forces that shape any social systems, social norms, technology, markets and law. And here I think the problem often becomes that we can't really get the markets tied back into these discussions. So as long as it's the lawyers, technologists, and the social scientists talking together, it's hard to see how we could go and really bigly shape shape these things. But one thing I found really interesting is to try and work with early stage startups that are only in the process of forming their values and building their algorithms. And there maybe we can have a little bit more, more power to enter the discussions. Whereas with the giants like Google and Facebook, it's pretty hard to make yourself heard in those discussions. Uh, thanks, uh, Laurence. I would like to add um, to your remark about Sherry Turkle. She, she was very optimistic in the beginning. She is not any longer. Um, <laughs> And uh, those of you who've read Alone Together may have recognized that in my gym slide, um, because that is actually an argument she's making very strongly, uh, that um, if um, boundaries between work and private life get dissolved and people have to be reachable 24-7, um, then, of course, they're going to be on their devices all the time. And then, of course, they're going to talk less to their children and to, their, to the people in the room. And this is going to have consequences. And we should not forget, I think, I mean, I hear all the time we should work with startups and we should do this and we should uh, influence technology and do user-driven requirements, I don't know what. And I really have to reiterate my point at the danger of repeating myself and boring you all to death. It is naive to think that if we keep relying on this being a business model where we don't pay, that this that anything is going to change. Um, and. Like, if, if we want free service, this is how, how we're going to pay. And there's going to be little shifts, maybe. Um, of course, when there's a big privacy problem and it's all over blogosphere, then Facebook is going to change something, or the state is going to change something just in order to bring in another actor for a change. Um, but at the end of the day, they have to make money in some way. And maybe the most interesting thing uh, that's going to happen with that is that the current business model they have is also not working, uh, which we tend to forget sometimes as well. I mean, they're not making big money at the moment. Um, so I would really encourage that we go more to thinking about business models, our willingness to behave differently, our willingness and ability um, to consume differently, um, and we'll take it from there. Would you like to respond to that? Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, that was an interesting list of comments that you added and questions. But I would like to correspond to um, your wondering about the challenges of context. Of course, I agree that, I mean, handling context is a really, really, really challenging problem. But the proposal is we can uh, actually tackle it from simple point of view or like uh, trying to address a very simple problem and at least with the parameters that I've I mean the three parameters that are existent mostly in every interaction via social software we can more or less define context in a certain uh, level of specificity or granularity so although this wouldn't be specific enough but why not to utilize it into giving more control or into defining more fine-grained access control policies rather than just saying, okay, I would only take the parameter of relationships probably and define my access control policies based on them. Um, but you also like uh, about how can we, to which extent we can trust or hand in the context detection uh, and context uh, identification uh, to machines rather than users. I guess here 
um, the problem would involve three different parts. So, firstly, uh, in each situation, there are certain fixed parameters. That I say, okay, uh, the time is a parameter that would more or less define context to a certain level of granularity. So, there is this certain fixed amount of parameters that users or machines wouldn't go wrong about. And then the other two parts would be uh, having the machine detecting the context and in AI, in artificial intelligence, there's like a lot of work uh, about detecting context. And in the third part, which all, uh, always complements the first two parts is users or humans in general. So even if I trust machines or certain algorithms into detecting context, users are the ones who actually would, at the end, validate uh, the, the, the success of uh, context definition, uh, context definition or context specification. So in that sense, I guess the problem is more or less a bit less complex than you, I mean, than we generally would think of it. And of course, there is a certain level of uh, fuzziness and uncertainty in certain cases. But if we, I mean, as, as uh, we discussed earlier, like if we at least utilize the fixed parameters that are existent in every social uh, and social network interaction, then this would already solve part of the problem better than it, better than it is currently being solved. So. And uh, you also talked about uh, giving, giving the users control. So when I said like uh, audience, for example, we, Ralph argued that audience need to be visible and Dave's presentation and my presentation, we said that audience need to be visible in order for, to allow users to uh, base their decisions based on a well-informed uh, assessment of the situation or context. But we also, uh, in access control, we really focus on control. So we say that it has to be possible to see the audience and know who the audience are. But it's not necessarily the fact that we enforce uh, knowing the audience on users. Because part of the social network interactions is based on like just simply being able to express oneself, say whatever, share whatever, um, just be free without actually taking care about who's going to be reading or who's going to be interacting or who, who my audience actually are. And I guess this in a sense relates to your proposal of like um, why not having programming languages that can be actually used by users themselves. So if we reach uh, this level of fine granularity of access control, I only talk about access control. So if we have this very different parameters of context that users can utilize in defining their, uh, their access control policies, then more or less that would be similar to providing users with programming languages and saying, okay, create whatever you want uh, your computer to do or your access control policy to do or something. So I guess this aims at giving, just like giving control to users. Are there any questions from the audience for our panel members? Yes, you go first. Paul Valentinovic, uh, Trans Center Amsterdam. Um, We've been uh, involved for some years in, to, in natural language processing uh, from a really commercial point of view and uh, been developing actually most robust English language and Russian language parsers, uh, which enables us to dig deeper and deeper in the language, which actually, connecting to you what you said, enables uh, technology to dig deeper and deeper in the context of uh, what users say and what they wouldn't like to say <laughs> and um, preventing those 
them to do that. Now, of course, it's not the focus. Why? Because basically, who pays? Uh, companies pay basically to understand what you're doing and understand how they can target you even better. So that's not the focus of our uh, doing and our research to enable users to protect themselves, but the other way around. However, like in the military, you have the best technology came from the military and war situations. They will be utilized later for the opposite party in peace. Uh, so, you know, just the question is, uh, is idealistic and great, and of course those technologies will be used to protect you later. Uh, but now the question is how really you make the switch from university situations, research-based uh, situations to, to real business-focused uh, projects, because this is what drives next research and pays for next research, and not only the EU grants which will be uh, dying with the natural death very quickly. Uh, Would you like uh, to respond uh, first? Go first. Uh, no, I, th Bethy, no? No. I think you, you can take it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you that unfortunately the, the big and powerful research is mostly being powered by the government or being, I mean, the outcome is is being used for something not for the good of the public, mostly, I don't know. But um, if you are, I mean, if you're doubting to which extent this, re this research, at least in our project in Spion, to which extent it can reflect or benefit the users, then I guess this is at least part of our mission, that whatever research, there has to be tools that we ourselves, we are the ones who are doing the research, so we, we, in our work, we're trying to also implement our ideas. Currently, there, there are a couple of tools that are being uh, shown in the, in the box, but that is, of course, in the, in the plan uh, to, to have some tools. But to which extent, of course, you know more about like natural lang language processing and how much like task forces it, it uh, involves in order to actually come up with even the single, a uh, very small module that would actually solve a problem with a certain amount of precision. So, of course, it's challenging and it's, of course, it, most of the times it's unfortunate because the work just covers a very small problem and it is not, mostly it is not uh, used by a large scale amount of users, but I guess we just hope, and, and at least in our project, we're a bit dedicated to producing certain tools. That's it. One, th one responsibility we certainly do have as tool builders is, again, go, the, uh, go along the awareness lane and say it's good to make people aware of how these tools work because that would educate them in saying, okay, how is your typical input going to be interpreted? Um, how is your typical in, uh, input going to be interpreted if somebody wants to give you a good recommendation or if somebody wants to censor you or whatever the purpose may be. Um, but um, that, that has to be done because uh, in a normal situation, people will not want to think deeply about some algorithmic details. They'll just want to get on, uh, get on with their lives. So the only chance we have is offering education and um, making space for people to want education. All right, I hope that answers your question. There was, yeah, on the corner? Yes, Mike. <coughs> a discussion um, about social behavioral change uh, as the key in order to enhance privacy, but I'm not sure there were any specific recommendations on practically how we can actually achieve um, social behavioral change in the short term and in the long term. So I'd like to hear more specific solutions on how we can achieve it and not just vaguely referring to it. And also, how can social behavioral change prevent like, 
big data issues, data mining, and I don't know, more, more specifically, surveillance technology companies from selling surveillance devices to intelligence agencies in repressive regimes, such as Gamma Group selling Pinfisher spyware in Turkmenistan. How can social behavioral change prevent that? And so many other issues which don't really have to do with society's behavior itself. So I think society, society behavior is significant in the sense that um, if, pe if people don't have a, a very strong sense of privacy, not a sense of privacy, but if they perceive privacy as control of data, as I think is the case now, then they might be more susceptible to vote or support regimes or parties or parties in general, which may provide this illusionary sense of control. So yeah, yes, we could, like, I suppose, uh, focus on that. And also it's very important to focus on um, the societal um, integration and familiarization with surveillance. But I'm not sure how, how vague social um, behavioral change can practically enhance privacy today and practically um, protect us from abuse and from surveillance from surveillance technology companies and other parties. Can I ask a question back? Um, I mean, <laughs> um, you're, you're making very, very important points and uh, you've made them before. Uh, and it's good that you make them again for every new panel. But I mean, at this point, I'd really like to ask, do you believe social change is possible? Or do you not believe it anyway? No, I believe social change can be possible, but I don't have any specific ideas. And since you've been discussing this for the last hour, I was wondering if you did. Okay, um, I mean, I can give my ideas, but uh, I could also let someone else start. Okay, and I don't want to be in the press tomorrow saying, Bettina Behrens says, uh, you can change uh, society by not being on Facebook. Um, <laughs> so, please don't cite me on that. Um, no, but I mean, seriously, it, it is a big range of things uh, from the very small um, personal decisions to the large decisions, and I'm sorry, I believe in democracy, so the large decisions have to be taken by voting for different parties, essentially. And again, now we can start the big discussion, is representative de democracy working or not? But we would get into a very different issue here. Um, so I think there's little things, like if someone only sends something to me, uh, if only sh shares information only with, with me, or reacts only to my requests, if I do that on Facebook, yeah. This is a societal action. This is putting me under pressure to contact them there, to make myself spyable. I've been through that. This was very funny. After the last privacy conference, I wanted to get a paper from one of the privacy researchers there. Um, he didn't answer his email. Um, I got a friend to, and I sent a Facebook request from my pseudonymous account, which of course was confusing. Um, so I got a friend who was already connected with uh, the clear name to this person to ask this person to send the paper to me. Uh, and then I commented on the paper and again the mailbox went dead. Okay, so this is what I call <laughs> a really useless uh, internet communication. So it's little changes, like how do I communicate? What do I share? Where do I share things? Uh, what do I do when I am in a relation of power? Like how do I act as a boss? Um, how do I act as a teacher? Which platforms do I use? Which platforms do I not use? How do I educate people? Because let's say, as an academic, that's my primary uh, multiplier role. Um, and you can take it from there and get, get bigger and have, uh, have decisions uh, from groups of people to not do certain things or to do certain things. And you can go uh, towards uh, legal initiatives, as long as you believe in the legal system, which I do. Um, you can go vote for different parties and so on. So it's the usual difficult process that democracy and that human uh, society is. There is no silver bullet, there is no uh, fast and quick solution for that. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I would like to hear more from the panel, but we have uh, some very anxious people here, I think, to have questions. So maybe the mister with the mic can go in the back first and then move back to the front. There's no, uh... yeah. um, I actually work for one of those companies which built a very invasive mobile app, which knows when you go to sleep, when you wake up, uh, where you are. We hope to return some value for our users for giving us that data. 
but that's not really the point. Even from the settings part of app, uh, there's about 200 alpha users now. They're very tech savvy. Half of them say we want more settings. The other half says please give us less privacy settings. We don't want to be bothered with all that. Um, there is a trend to kind of dumbify as well Android design guidelines. Since short say if a setting for a mobile app applies to only 20% of users, just get rid of it, set the default. Um, and even when we get those amount of settings correct, um, what way do you put them when the user first joins? They don't want to go through a question list asking 20 questions on how they want us to treat their data because they just want to use the app. But if we close everything down, there is no value in the app. They'll leave us. They'll say, oh, this isn't interesting, this isn't fun. If we open everything up and give them as much value and information back as we can, we might have gone too far. So at the moment we're doubting, maybe ask a few questions. What do you expect from us? How many data are you willing to give? Put the default settings pattern from that, give them that to start with, and then let them fine tune later on, or just put everything open, and with every piece of information we serve them, say we deduce this because, for instance, we know when you were asleep because we are reading your light sensor and your sound sensor, can we continue to do this, or would you like to turn this off, but then you're not getting this information anymore. So I think small startups definitely do think about privacy issues because there's no reason for us to antagonize our users, but it's kind of a hard call to make. Also, for instance, to say, don't pull in the contact lists. Users ask us, please notify me when my friend joins your program, which we can only do if we actually store that contact list. So it's, it's a very hard balance. And I think I heard a lot of idealistic things today and yesterday but that's not something that's going to happen in the next 10 years. And if there are ideas about practical solutions, which could just be implemented by the providers, by the apps, which wouldn't cost them too much money, which wouldn't cost them users, but which would help users to be more private or more secure if they want to. All right, thank you. Ralph, do you want to re respond? Um, so basically, it's the problem of um, when you have developed your technology is that you can overwhelm the persons with privacy issues and now as well, and you really do not know how to ensure their privacy and do not bother them with information. That's, that was your problem that you were describing. Mm. Yeah, so basically, I think that's one thing that you should, really should do when, when talking about privacy. You should always know that there's a balance to be kept. It's, it's, it's an old definition, so it's, it's from Altman. It's keeping, uh, uh, keeping a balance between withdrawal and disclosure. And, and basically, when you ask users to um, mind privacy settings, you also should take into, take into account opportunities that whatever application that you make uh, provides the user as well. So at that moment on, they can make a balanced decision. And basically what the problem, I guess, is as well is that now you have a tool that's already been yeah, created. So basically what should have happened is that from the startup on, when you're creating a new tool, and that, that it's a sort of a privacy by design approach that from the, prob uh, from the definition of the problem from start on to the solution, is that the user should be embedded in it. And I think that's one of the, the major problems right now. We have all of these uh, technologies, but now we want to embed privacy after the technology has been built. So that's not an easy thing, and I really don't know how we should tackle that. But one thing that I find useful is, is keeping a balance between empowerment and self-alienation. So in one way or another, you should really make the, the user aware. On the other hand, you should empower them. But how does have, that have to happen concretely for your technology, I don't know. We should look into that. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ralph. Bettina. 
just, just a quick addition to that. Um, I don't know what your app does, I don't know how your business model works and so on, but let's say I'm assuming this is really for functionality. Um, I mean, it's been shown in lots of uh, user research that if you explain to people why you're getting this particular piece of data at this particular point in time, um, it will make them a lot, le a mo lot more understanding and a lot more, let's call it, uh, negatively compliant, but I would call this really positively. I mean, if they want an information from you and you need some information to process, to process that, then it's perfectly legitimate to ask for that piece of data. I can't go to the doctor and say, no, I'm not going to open my mouth uh, if, if I have a cold to let, you see, to let you look into that. That doesn't make any sense. And people know that. And I think the big problems we're talking about is not data that are being used for functionality. The big problems we're talking about is data that are being used for unclear purposes or for third-party purposes, repurposing and so on. Um, and some apps try to think of like, oh, uh, all the functionality that we have to offer uh, should be available to the user once they've bought our app in the App Store. And then um, there's something where you only look for a connection, train connection, all of a sudden wants to access your contacts, which is bizarre. Which, of course, under certain circumstances has its uses. But that doesn't make sense. This overwhelms users. This makes them really aggressive. And, and, and hostile towards your tool. And I think I would go for that staged approach. And I would add that um, I think it's really important to be very clear about how the information is being used. So if this algorithm is being yes. run on your information, you should know yeah. if you're seeing some, an ad based on an algorithm, you should know how that decision was made. If a user decides that they don't want to be a user anymore, make it very easy for them to delete their information and make sure the information is really deleted. Um, so basically just giving the user control over and knowledge about what is being done with this information, especially if it sounds like it's very, as you say, invasive. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, you're in the back. Okay. So, so I think it's a, it's a very fascinating discussion, um, but I would like to just sort of bring up a point which I think is coming off of yours. So I work for the World of Web Consortium, we're a standards body. And essentially, like, yes, and thank you very much for your P3P. Um, and, the, the, you know, it's a difficult position because for better or for worse, the business model of the web is to some extent um, users' personal data, tracking users, knowing what users want. And I think the thing which is interesting is users, in some cases, really do find real value to that. At the same point, it's not done in a transparent and accountable manner. So. I would almost say that while I, I, I think I've really enjoyed the discourse so, so far, we, we, there, is a, there is a real problem, which I think that this research community needs to, to tackle. And I think it's sort of the framing of the problem. So the traditional privacy framing is that an individual wants control over their data and possibly they store it on their own local machine, which is kind of unsafe, but we can go into that later. And, and that this data is, sort of is theirs and they have rights over it just as they have rights say, over their body. At the same point, one of the reasons I think Facebook and these platforms have been so successful is that they do, to some extent, genuinely provide people new capacities and new capabilities that they would not otherwise have. So, for example, you know, being recommended events and friends is actually useful for many people. Data mining can discover things which are you know, socially good, and often just economically good, but could be used for socially good things. So I think maybe what we should look at in this field is not just how do we defend individuals' rights today, but how can we enable groups of people to gather together to find new capacities over the internet in whichever context they choose and be transparent to each other while at the same point being opaque to perhaps forces or people who they don't agree with. And that's a, little, that's a different framing of the question because instead of focusing on individuals, you really do, I think, need to ultimately focus on groups, instead of rejecting data mining out of hand, we have to discover ways that data mining can be done in a way that is actually transparent and accountable. And that's difficult, but I do think it is technically possible. Yeah, thank you. I, I, you're probably also aware of um, the MIT Media Lab and the work they do on trust frameworks. And so I think that probably goes in the direction that, that you're mentioning. 
It's a different framing, yes, that I really appreciate, actually. Uh, anybody in the panel who would like to respond? Yeah. So basically, within my presentation, I also mentioned that one of the final things that you should do is involve the community, but maybe that's a bit too late. I understand there's a lot of tension, and also within the sociologic discipline, it's always between agency and structure. It's also between groups and individuals. But I'm going to give a concrete example. Um, I, I'm also a teacher, in, uh, I'm, I also did my teacher's education in political and social sciences, and our project is also, um, has also a societal goal. So mainly what we're doing is um, I'm giving workshops to a lot of youth movements and on, on privacy settings, how can, you, uh, how can you employ them, and what are the limits of the, the privacy policies right now on online social network sites, and um, sometimes we discuss um, other privacy technologies like, like Scramble or, or Freeview, I presented as well. But basically, one of the last things I always mention is that just, it's, uh, it's youth movement, I don't know, uh, it's like a Boy Scout kind of thing. I always, um, the last thing that I ask of them is to sit together and talk about their notion on privacy and look at their structures within their community and then let them take, uh, take their decision for themselves. Is that the same structure that there is on Facebook? Can we employ the same hierarchies, the same values, the same norms there as well? Yes. Maybe it's more of a social privacy problem, I know, but basically that's how I try to involve the community as well into making decisions. And basically, one thing that they also mention is that then the responsibility is not pushed towards the individual, it's pushed towards the community. They make the decisions for themselves, but often there's a tension within the individual. I don't really know how to tackle that problem, but it's a difficult one. All right, thank you. I know it's, uh, we're running late, but we have time for one more question. And I think Sita had a question. Okay. Um I don't know if Claudia is still here, but if Claudia was here, she would talk with you and say, we can do the contacts list for you without collecting the data and it will match the contacts for you, right? We have the pets for you. Since she's not here, I'll impersonate her for a couple of seconds. Um, one of the discussions I was having during your research visit next, last week was the question, if the problem is not so much that we're losing privacy, but that the private is taking over the public. And I'm just wondering if in any of your research, you also asked about what it means for people to be public, what it means to have a public discussion, and what happens when, you know, like in the data protection regulation, there was this problem, the proposal for um, uh, right to be forgotten, and this was like so somehow intuitively beautiful for people. I said, I can, you know, at any time delete things I have put up, um, which kind of, you know, says the private is much more important than the public and the continuity of discussion in the public. Um, and it kind of relates to what Bettina was saying. I think the, the kind of use of the phone in the public space is also this private being brought constantly into the public. Um, I'm very interested, especially from Kate and Ayri, to hear if you did something on this. And finally, relating to that, because of this right to be forgotten and other things, social privacy, how does it interact with regulation? Does data protection apply, or should it apply to things you're doing? Um, or should actually regulators stay out of social privacy and negotiation of boundaries? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, I was thinking, uh, Ari, you have a, a response for that? So lots, lots of tough questions. I think definitely coming to the last point, there's a lot to social privacy where it would be somewhat weird for there to be laws about how, how we go about our daily interactions. There are probably some spots where legislation could be done. I'm really not the right person to tell you what those, those could be, but there's a lot where it really, I, I have a tough time imagining how it would be a legal legal question to think about. So do you mean um, kind of like a, a say that a focus on um, private and kind of egocentric rather than communities? Yeah, that's, um, so the other thing I do is actually game design and I don't make video games, I make physical games that people tend to play in public spaces and there seems to be this real kind of interest that people are having in getting away from the screen and kind of turning towards communities. So there's a board game cafe in Toronto where I'm from in Canada and they've had to expand three times um, because of people just wanting to come and be together and not be in front of the screen. And so I think there is this feeling 
it, within the zeitgeist that there there is a need. For, I mean, this is kind of cliche and the whole bowling alone to have this problems with that that kind of ideal notion of this past where we had these perfect communities. But I do think that there is um, a feeling, a sense that we we do we were craving more community than we've had. And even on the internet, um, before Facebook, I remember it was very much focused on forums where people were coming together around interest rather than kind of egocentric networking. And so I have a few groups now that I've been working with and they really want to have community space online that isn't Facebook. And I don't know what to recommend to them for a platform. So even technologically, I think that there is kind of a lack of this that used to, we used to have more on the internet. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but I do think that there is, so, there is a zeitgeist feeling towards that, yeah. And maybe to come, come back a little bit also to your earlier comment on, or comparison to the mall, I think that's, that's a really nice way to think about the public spaces and how they're being transformed. Also offline, there's a lot of talk about how much of our public interactions now are taking place in actually commercial spaces and a similar thing happening online, so maybe there's time to think whether everything online needs to be a business, and if not, what are the ways to support those structures that aren't based on business models? All right. Just some remark about the, uh, should legislators stay out of uh, private relationships, or uh, however you phrased it, Seda? Um, did you phrase it like that? Uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, I would say most definitely not. I mean, of course, it's a very difficult issue and uh, legislators and society has to be very careful uh, to not be too invasive and uh, too nanny state, to use uh, another uh, fighting word uh, like. But, I mean, if we look at recent examples, you know that the consensual cannibalism judgment was, is always my favorite <laughs> example. Or, uh, let's say, consensual uh, incest or... Uh, I don't know what consensual pedophilia. I mean, there's lots of things where you can argue that there's two people who want something or two, uh, two agents who want something and the state gets into it and with good measure and with, with a good reason. Um, and we definitely should not ex exclude that. We should have values as a society and we should keep renegotiating them but keeping them up because otherwise we can't live together. Or, okay, you have the final word then. Okay, thanks. Um, that's a very interesting question. I, I really hadn't thought about it, but I think that I, I think that I, I think we're forgetting that social and privacy, uh, social and informational privacy uh, are real and, and an analytical differentiation that we make. So basically, I'm also tending to agree that we do not need a legislation for social privacy, but basically there are a lot of new um, maybe privacy invasion uh, practices like frictionless sharing and so on. So basically what do you do with that? Basically you have an, an intertwinement between social and informational privacy. So I don't think that's, that we just can say no, legislation does not have to meddle with social privacy. I, I think it's more complex than that. Well, thank you for your uh, last words. Thank you so much, uh, the present presenters, for really wonderful and food for thought discussions. And thank you, audience. And uh, obviously, questions can be asked during the break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.